Let me just say a few words before we get to the text. Thank you, Anna, for leading us in worship. I'm so blessed. I'm so blessed. When we stop to thank the Lord for our blessings, How much we have. How much we have. I know we've suffered loss. I know there's pain sometimes in the offering. I know sometimes your hearts are wished for things to be different. You know what God wishes, and he not only wishes, but he longs for hearts to be made different. And he wants to do that. He's the one who changes hearts. He's the best at it. And I love, I love his church because he's in control. He's in control of your situation. And it's a constant battle to render and turn it over. Turn it over. Can't carry it, can't do it yourself. And he invites you to come. Isaiah said to come. You don't have any money, you come. The kingdom is not about having enough money to get in. That's not what it's about. It's just simple responding the invitation is showing up letting God be God he's a God who understands our thoughts afar off the psalmist said he is intimately acquainted how many times have you gone to the Lord and you didn't have the words to express your feelings. You know what? That's a beautiful thing. Even when you don't have the words to express how you feel, God understands. And he knows exactly what's in your heart. Because God is a God who understands feelings. He understands thoughts, intentions of the heart. He understands all that we are going to. And then we'll get to get to the text, which is Hebrews 4, verse 11. I'll read on the first few verses. Let us therefore be diligent to enter the rest. That rest, he calls it. That rest. Enter that rest. There's a rest in God like no other. There's a peace in God that only God can give. Remember when Jesus says, peace I give to you? When the disciples were troubled at heart because Jesus was talking about leaving them? John 14 says, let not your hearts be troubled. See, God knows when our hearts are troubled or upset, and he says to us, I will fill that. I will carry that for you. I will take that upon myself. I will be your peace in the middle of storm. Let anyone, let's, let's be diligent to enter that rest, lest anyone fall through following the same example of disobedience he's referring to most of the children of Israel that were disobedient to trusting God. And then he jumps into verse 12, saying this, For the word of God is living and active and sharper than any two-edged sword, piercing as far as the division of soul and spirit, 
of both joints and marrow and able to judge the thoughts and the intentions of the heart. God is always aware of our intentions. Nothing can be hidden from the Lord. And man through mankind, for the creation of man, Adam and Eve failed in the garden. Uh, what did they do? The first thing they, after they failed, they hid themselves. Because they were ashamed, they were afraid as what was going to happen. Things changed. Sin brought death. Sin brought the curse. Sin brought shame. Their eyes were open. And they felt ashamed. They didn't have clothes and they felt ashamed, and God comes looking for them. And they were pierced through the divisions of the soul and spirit. They felt separated from God. They felt like they could never face God. And see, why they were in their sin, God came looking for them, calling their names. And what this enemy is good at is if he can keep people in shame, keep people in their guilt, and tie them up, so to speak, that they never feel good enough that they could ever come to God. And the opposite is the truth. God sees the potential you and I have in him. When we can put aside ourself, put aside our shame, and let the word of God speak to us, and he says, for God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whoever, whoever, whoever believes in him should not perish but have everlasting life. That is a truth from God's word that has opened many hearts across our world to understand that there is, there is room for them. There is a place for them that God is designing. As he told the disciples, where I'm going, you who may, I'm going to prepare a place. He didn't say a mansion. Well, it's, some version may say a mansion. The song Ira Stanfield, I believe it was, wrote, I've got a mansion. Guess what? I'll be happy with a little cabin. <laughs> I just want to get there. I want to be with my Lord. It's going to be okay. God's got a place. You know what? God's got a place right now, right now for you and I. He has a place. He has you in his heart. He has you on his heart. He knows your name. This Prophet Isaiah said he inscribed the names upon his poem. If you're like me, my biggest enemy is myself. I tend to beat myself up over my mistakes. Yeah. You know what? I'm not going to stay there. I may have my moments, but I begin to look at his word. David, the, the man called David who was, became king, was in process as a young boy. God called him. Before he killed a giant, he killed a lion, he killed a bear, I believe it was prepared him for the giant. And sometimes we are not sure why these things happen in our life, these unexpected things. And God may be preparing us for something bigger. And that he's going to help you bring down the giants. And he's going to help you bring down the walls of Jericho in your life, in your, your schools, or in your your home, in your relationships, 
and family, broken families need the Lord. And so you look at the word, and it's never, ever, 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 ever meant to be used as a billy club. What do I mean by that? Well, there's a difference between the Spirit of God convicting people than man trying to convict people. I'm letting you know God does a whole better job. We speak the truth in love, I understand. But it is only, only, only by the help of the Holy Spirit that he convicts people and convinces people of truth. The Holy Spirit convinces people of their need for Christ. And when people respond to that, when people respond to their understanding of their need for Christ, then we are put ourselves in the position to become transformed, become changed, become uh, our heart is, 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 is due. Any man being Christ, he is a new creation. You begin to think differently. You begin to have uh, understanding. The Holy Spirit helps you to def- figure out what the Word is actually saying to us. He brings it into the depths of soul and spirit, both joints and marrow, and able to judge the thoughts and intentions of the heart. And having said all of that, now he goes into this subject. Verse 14, since then we have a great high priest who has passed through the heavens, Jesus, the Son of God. Let us hold fast our confession, for we do not have a high priest who cannot sympathize with our weaknesses. Weaknesses. Wow. And in other words, God still looks at us as something that's valuable, someone that is valuable in spite of your weaknesses. In fact, you read the Old Testament on through the New, it was not perfect people that God used. Hardly any, if any. King David failed adulterous sin. Moses got angry a few times. Noah got drunk. We can go down the list. We don't condemn them. It just shows our humanity. Remember last Sunday, flesh and the spirit. I like it. To, I like it too. If we we need to feed the spirit, feed on God's Holy Spirit, on the Word of God. Feed the inner man, your spirit man, and starve the flesh. I'm not saying don't eat forever, and that you know what I mean. No, just just avoid things that. Feed the flesh. So, the Lord knows everything about you, yet he says, come. In fact, he initiated this invitation. The Bible says, while we were yet sinners, when we didn't realize, when we knew not what we were doing, when we were ignorant, God says, you come. And he begins to speak about the priest. The Old Testament priests, they had weaknesses. So much that they had to offer sacrifices first for their own sins. Then they were able to offer sacrifices for the sins of the people. But Jesus, offering himself once, he never had any sin. Only he took the sins of, the, of mankind and he became sin. In other words, he became the sin offering. And he takes upon himself all of our weaknesses. And he says, now I want to make you strong in me. And see, Paul described something like a thorn in his flesh. There's something that we don't know if it was sort of like a weakness in his body, something that was always there. He asked the Lord for for healing, but God says, my grace is sufficient in your weakness. How many know your weaknesses? And you don't have to raise your hand. We all know our own weaknesses.
Guess what? God is your strong arm. He is your strength. I was petrified in high school, grade school, of having to give a speech of any kind. Remember? Some of you don't. It didn't bother you. Well, for me, it was a whole just agonized. Got up. I think I was in sixth or seventh grade, probably seventh grade. I was. Linda remembers the old, the old high school before they tore it down. The place was falling down, literally up fifth floor. It was plaster coming off the walls. They condemned that floor while they were building the new one. And I remember, I think I was on fourth floor, Linda, and I don't know if remember the teacher, but we had to give a two-minute speech. I think I lasted 11 seconds. <laughs> and just, I could feel my face was beat red and just sat down. I got tongue-tied, just petrified, weaknesses, weaknesses. I relate real, real well as they re read through the Old Testament and they get to the part where Moses is called by God and Moses argues with God and says, I can't talk. Get somebody else. You ever had arguments with God? Wrestling matches, so to speak. He always wins. He always wins. But he does it in a way doesn't make you do it. He changes your heart so you want to do it. And you're okay with it. And all of a sudden now you realize you're not walking in your own strength anymore. You discover that when you got up to talk or when you went to this person to talk to, all of a sudden God gave you something to say. Or God puts an idea in your heart to send a note to someone. Or give a call, or give a text, whatever you do. That's what God thinks. It's really all we are is flesh and blood, earth and vessels, subject to sickness, subject to being hurt. We're fragile, very easily broken. But God in us helps you when you don't know what to say, when you don't know what to do, when you're, so to speak, tongue-tied. I remember, I don't remember it exactly, I think it was a 20th class reunion. They asked me to have a prayer. By now, I was okay with that. By now they had, I think here's what it was, they never heard me talk before. <laughs> yeah. And I had kids come out, I never heard you talk before. You never said anything in high school. <laughs> yeah, I got the, the most, um, I think I got the shyest in 77 archive, shyest, the shyest. And I got voted as one of the most changed. And another kid who was an athletic kid, he got the most changed because he put on a lot of weight. <laughs> That's how I was, I was good. I was good. So you see, it's not how you start. God sees the end product. God sees you walking in his likeness. When he called you on day one, when he set you apart for himself, when you knew that Jesus, where, whenever, whatever, however it happened, Jesus is in your heart. Now you just begun, you just have be, just started out. Barely able to recognize his voice and still struggling sometimes. You recognize his voice, it takes discipline, practice, and confirmation. I'm kind of a slow learner. I need to hear it again, Lord. 
I need a confirmation. I want to be sure. Have you ever faced a week where you thought, I'll never, I don't know how I'm going to get through this week? Or a day. Back it up, even an hour. And so you whisper a prayer, you call upon the Lord and say, help me now, Jesus, I need you. Guess what? He's off. He loves to come upon the scene. And he rises up because the Bible says, out of your innermost being shall flow rivers of living water. I begin to figure out a couple things about the Holy Spirit. Holy Spirit, I used to think, would be poured out upon me, and I'd just kind of run down over me. Then I got to study in Scripture. And the Holy Spirit, actually, Jesus was talking about, out of your innermost beings shall flow rivers of living water. So you begin to feel there's something inside of you turning. And it begins to, he wants to speak to you. He wants to give you a prayer language. He wants you to empower you. He wants to give a boldness to you that you will not be yourself. Oh, you keep your personality, and God has fun with that. I think he, he loves to take people that you never thought, you never think. And I love, I love how God works takes people that are in wheelchairs and they can't walk and he uses them. <coughs> he takes people that are blind and can't see and he uses them. Though he can open the blinded eyes, sometimes he chooses not to. To demonstrate his grace over and over again in your weakness. I remember Johnny and your, your, Tony, your, she said something that affected, you know, God use her weaknesses more it's unbelievable. She's touched more people through her weakness. You see, what we need to do with our weakness is tr turn it over to the Lord. If we, if we beat ourselves up with our weakness and we condemn ourselves, then we're cutting ourselves off. We're cutting ourselves short from his grace. And we read on in this text. We do not have a high priest who cannot sympathize with our weaknesses, but one who has been tempted in all things as we are yet without sin. Let us therefore draw near with confidence. Notice this. Jesus understands temptation. Jesus understands weakness. He was tempted by the devils. Hey, you don't have to go through this. If you bow down to me, well, guess what, Satan? I'm not going to bow down. Like the children of Israel who did not bow down to the image. Instead, they said, even if our God does not spare us from the fiery furnace, we will not bow down. They took their stand. And see, there's, the secret is being surrendered to being sold out, so to speak. It does not matter what others think. I'm not here to please man. I'm here to be a lighthouse. Or as my friend, Brother Glenn Galt, as I grew up, as he's the one who Late, prayed for me as a boy receiving Christ stood with tears facing down and screaming down his cheeks on a Monday afternoon on a fellowship day fellowship sectional fellowship meeting he would stand before the men and cry and talk about his testimony and he said if I can just be an encouragement to someone else that's all that's really all what it's about Unless I have a little pain now and, this, now and then, I'll never know any, how to relate to anyone else. You're getting the picture. Jesus relates to us because he's had pain. And guess what? He agonized before he ever got to the cross 
not wanting to go through it. His weakness, his earthen vessel. But he says, not my will, but yours. Friends, we serve a high priest who not only wants you to come, he understands how you feel before you come. And before you ever come, you don't have to even sometimes say how you feel when you don't really know how to express how you feel. Here's what the scripture says. You come, one, come, and, and, and come in confidence. In other words, you come not in your own confidence. You come in the confidence that it's by his grace that and the fact that he saved you, that he's calling you, that it's by his grace, it's not by anything you can conjure up. Because there's confidence in the Lord. There is a place for you. Yes, in eternity there's going to be a place, but there's a place now for you in his presence. There's a place for you that has your name on it. That is, a, no one else can take your place. He has reserved a place for you. He wants you to come. And he knows exactly how you are and how you're feeling and what you're carrying. And you do it together. And you're there, there. It's there. It's in his throne room. It's in his mercy. That's where you find help in the time of your need, in the mercy and the grace of Jesus Christ begins to fill you up and you begin to, to heal wounds. He's able to bring that which was meant for, for wrong or, or hurt toward you. He's able to help you let it go. He's able to help you forgive people, otherwise you could not. He's able to help you see the potential in people that have hurt you, even when it's hard. He's able, he's able. Amen. You may can find grace to help in time of need. There's a lot of suffering in our world. We don't have to look very far, do we? But through this suffering, God has a way of bringing people, calling. Actually, it's like a preparing the soil of the heart. So when a person realizes there's just nothing working, nothing works, I don't have peace, only when I surrender. Your worth is defined in him alone. I mentioned while we were yet sinners. The scriptures teach about how we are earthen vessels. We are fragile. He is the treasure. Your worth is based upon the fact that Christ emptied himself for you. Your worth is not based upon what others say about you or what you think about yourself even. It's not based upon how many works you do for him. God loves you as you are. We're saved by his grace. Now that we're saved, somehow our attitude changed. We want to do something that will contribute. Amen? So all of a sudden we got this new heart. Now I want to make a difference. I think for a lot of people in this world, in this life, what they're feeling a lot of times, why am I here? What is my purpose? And why do I, what is the reason? And God is saying, I created you for myself, to know me, and together we become a team. You become his hand, his feet. You become his mouthpiece. You become almost like a firebrand in his quiver that he uses to advance the kingdom. How does he do it? He does it because he's 
everywhere at once by the Holy Spirit. How could he know everyone's heart and mind all at the same time? Only because he's God. Did you know that he knows all the names of the stars? Blows my thinking. I can't think that far. He's calling you. You are worth it. He is calling to you, you're worth it. He gave himself up for you. He laid his life down for you. And all he says, just to believe, accept what I've done for you. It's the invitation. It's a door that he wants you to open of your heart. And you begin to open that door. You begin to say yes to Jesus. You know, I, I don't have all the answers. When I answered the first time at an altar as a small boy, it was, it was, it was oh, it just feel, felt like I, I knew that I was ready for heaven. I knew my sins were washed away. I knew, but there came a period in my life that God called me to a second that was a second calling. It wasn't a second salvation, but it was a calling to him and to lordship and to surrender. And God will, will be patient with you and I, but he never gives up. He not just does not force you. If you're here today and you've never really said yes to Jesus, but you're thinking about it, in the quietness of your own heart, at, maybe it's before you go to sleep at night on your pillow. I encourage you to just say yes to Jesus. You can say, I don't even understand it all. But there's something pulling on my heart. And you just say yes to Jesus. And let him come in. That's where it begins. Wherever it may be, it could be here today, right where you're sitting. Because Jesus wants you to understand that there is a place, that he has a throne of grace, and he does not want you to stay bound in sin. He does not want you to stay as you are. He wants you to become more through his transforming power. And no matter where you're at today, you can have a new beginning. And it's such a wonderful, wonderful. God is a God of beginnings, new beginnings, new beginnings, new chance, second chances, third chances, fourth chances, on and on and on. And on. He never gives up on you. We've been praying for people. You've been praying. Some of you keep it up. Some of you have been Wondering if anything's ever going to happen. Don't give up. God is not. He's not finished with us yet. We're going to sing one more song. They actually are moving toward what is known as a prayer time, and we call it the altar. Basically, it's a, it's a time in the service where we just bring ourselves to the Lord, uh, bring our hearts, bring our feelings, our fears, whatever it may be, uh, whatever you're going through. He, this song just kind of uh, paints that picture where, where we may be at today, wherever you're at. And let's sing it, Anna, if you lead us.